was fantastic coming in here and got my temperature taken. I was really, really felt at home immediately. I uh, hope to get my flu jab on the way out. So, um, and uh, have you noticed over the last six or nine months, we're all starting to use some words that a year ago we wouldn't be using, like the word Zoom. If you asked me what Zoom was two years ago, I would have no idea. Other words we're hearing every day is the word pandemic. Are you using that word a lot? Um, and there's also uh, this word corona, and there's the unprecedented use of the word unprecedented, and there's this phrase self-isolation and masks are on the agenda. So, but there's another word that's come up a lot, and it's called the word essential. If you've come across that word, there are certain jobs that are essential, and there's certain travel that is essential. And I got a large uh, sticker from my car because I'm an essential worker. But I just had a question, and it was this: Are the things of God essential? Is 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 the word of God essential? It's never been more essential. Is prayer essential? Is this ministry essential? Yes, let's be sensible. And I praise God for the integrity of how you're keeping the public health guidelines even tonight. But don't despise or apologize for the essential nature of this ministry. Because this country desperately needs God more than a vaccine. And we need the word of God more than ever. And one of the concerns that's coming up is uh, with all the restrictions is the whole thing about mental health. Uh, I think you've probably noticed that on the news as well. And I am concerned about mental health, but I'm even more concerned about spiritual health and the spiritual health of this city and the spiritual health of this nation. And uh, just a little testimony from myself. When all of this pandemic started and we were navigating as a church, you know, how to respond, we had just started a series on the book of Exodus. And I was thinking in like myself, do we just continue to speak on the book of Exodus? Or do we change it all because of the news and the crisis? And you know what we decided to do? We decided we would continue to look at the book of Exodus. And then I discovered it's right in line with what we needed to hear during this time and during this season. And I just want to share a few thoughts that we've been seeing through the book of Exodus that are relevant right now to us all and to the country. Just one scripture. It's always good to read at least one Bible verse, isn't it? And this is Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction. Now listen to this. That through endurance... And through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Endurance, that through the scriptures, we would have encouragement. Do we need some encouragement? Fresh courage? We certainly do. Do we need hope? That was one of the words you, you profile in your prayer. Yes, we need hope. And is it possible that the Bible can give us encouragement and hope? Particularly just thinking briefly about the book of Exodus. Um, and uh, are you familiar with the book of Exodus? I don't have to read the entire 40 chapters. You've seen the Prince of Egypt. Um, have you seen the Ten Commandments, Turton Heston? Have you heard all the stories at Sunday school? How God took a despised, oppressed people, set them free. At the beginning of the book, they're under an evil power, Pharaoh. At the end of the book, they're under God. And they're delivered out of Egypt, out of slavery, through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, get the revelation of the tabernacle, and at the conclusion of the book, we see the presence and the glory of God right in the middle of the camp. Fantastic story. And I just want to give you four, very quickly, four spiritual lessons from the book of Exodus that are relevant to how we can appropriately respond to the challenges we're in. And, and the four points begin with the word spectacular. So the first thing we see in the book of Exodus is a spectacular ten plagues. Now I don't want to get into the theology of 
you know, did God send the plagues? Did he allow the plagues? Was it the devil? What, you know, all those kind of questions. But this is the point. What the ten plagues did to Egypt and for Israel is it exposed the frailty and the temporary nature of everything that nation depended on. The river Nile was turned to blood. The Nile was important. It was a source of life, a source of fish, a source of irrigation. That without the Nile, without all the things associated with it, the social and economic comfort of that uh, basis of that country would be shaken to its core. And I thought like this, that sounds a little bit like what may be happening across the globe today. That all the things that, that we put our security in, the social, economic, the healthcare system, education, even entertainment for goodness sake, they, they cancelled the premiership. And the interesting thing about these plagues, it exposed what they were depending on for security. Actually, it exposed the gods they were worshipping. And so it was no small thing, this spectacular uh, ethos that something was shaken to its core. And, uh, and that has happened to many lives, that's happened to us, it's happened across the globe, particularly in the West. And so the point is this, the church has been awakened and the world has been awakened and it's needed awakened. Um, and even, the, I have seen fear at every level of society. I've seen it in elderly people who are alone. Uh, just on the phone this morning with a woman whose husband has COVID. He's probably going to die and she's convinced she's got COVID. I'm putting my affairs in order and I'm living alone. And there's fear at that level. But did you know there's actually fear in government? There's fear in the public health system. I've seen doctors terrified. But in that fear and in that uncertainty, could that be a trigger to turn to God, to look to God, to value the things of God? I always like to say this, the scriptures were written, um, they're divine, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they were written into real human life, gritty human life. Book of Exodus, those guys were not going around saying, isn't this a beautiful type of when Christ comes? They were sweating. You know, so they were suffering, they were crying out to God. That, that when Paul wrote, nothing will separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. You know what? Paul wasn't trying to come up with a sermon for next Sunday. You know, he's sitting with his, his double espresso with the latest worship music on in the background. And then he came up with this beautiful statement, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He had experienced every single one of those things. And that puts grittiness and backbone into Christians and into the church if we could only get a revelation of it. And so that's the first thing. The second thing, am I too quick here? Is it okay? Um, the second thing is there was a spectacular deliverance and salvation in the book of Exodus. It really was. You know the story. They, they got delivered, you know, about the lamb and the blood of the lamb over the doorpost that final night. Two million people were delivered and saved and set free. But remember this. That's nothing compared to the salvation that we needed and that we've experienced. And that's the second point I want to make. There's something happens when you're awakened to realize that the salvation that we have in Christ is absolutely spectacular. It's higher and more spectacular than what they experienced. And so often we doubt, our, we doubt what we really believe. We apologize for being a Christian. You know, that we, we you know, I wanna, I wanna encourage you, your faith is real and in, in a real event and in a real person. And uh, my appreciation of Christ crucified, Christ risen, and Christ will come again has been elevated during this uncertain time. And we need to really believe that. I was really struck by a phrase the Apostle Paul used about the gospel. He referred to the gospel as my gospel. And I was got to think, what do you mean your gospel, Paul? It's our gospel. It's the whole world's gospel. 
And it was almost like Paul would say, I know that. It's the gospel of God. It's the gospel of Christ. And it's the gospel of God's grace. But it's my gospel. And I got to thinking about that. And I was preaching the gospel one time overseas. And I got an illustration stirred in my spirit. And I began to say like this. My wife really loves me. But she didn't die for me. My children really love me, but they didn't die for me. My friends really love me, but they didn't die for me. My favorite football team didn't die for me. No, no politician died for me. No cause died for me. Jesus died for me, and he rose from the dead. And I believe that's, that's one of the things that has really come through for me in these days. Do I really believe this incredible gospel, this incredible salvation? So that's, that's the first two. There was a spectacular plague which is teaching us about, about exposing all the frail things that we depend on and the spectacular deliverance or salvation they had and we had. And then the third thing is they had a spectacular provision in the wilderness. I mean, just read the story. I mean, can you imagine two million people, no bread, no water, and there's provision? Can you imagine the, 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 the gossiping that was going on and the complaining that was going on and the blame game that was going on? You know, once Moses was so frustrated with these people, he wanted to die. He wanted to die. This is too much for me. But God supplied their every need dramatically and supernaturally and spectacularly. Will he also provide for us during our wilderness? Absolutely guaranteed. I want to encourage you. We have a provider. Orientate yourself to receive from God when you need it most. Orientate yourself to receive from God and be good news for other people during wilderness challenges and situations. I was thinking about the Lord's Prayer. And we know the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then there's this phrase, give me my daily bread. How many times have you actually had to pray that in reality? I mean, I pray, give me my daily bread. I've got three weeks of bread in the freezer. But something happens when life uh, and challenges come when you literally have to pray about even your daily bread. Even the concerns you have for your grandchildren. Even the concerns you have for your children's education. Give us our daily bread. I think that's something that's happening to the church as well. That we're realizing we're not playing games. And we have a real God who can supply us during those times. And uh, I, I wrote a little phrase uh, here. God is enough. And then I, I repented. And then I wrote another phrase. He is more than enough. We have an all-sufficient God who loves us and is with us and can supply us and our loved ones. Let's really press in. Let's really believe. Believe our beliefs. Believe his promises. So that's the, the third. And now the fourth. And this is my favorite. There's a spectacular plague that teaches us not to depend on anything that's frail and temporary. Let's be spiritually minded. There's the spectacular salvation that they had. We have an even greater salvation. Don't lose your appreciation of Christ and the gospel. And there's this spectacular provision in the wilderness. And then finally, there's a spectacular end to God's purpose. And that's what gives us hope. Hope is really, really important. In treating people with depression, for example, one of the questions that the counselor will ask is, do you, you're feeling really low, do you feel you will eventually get better? They're, they're fishing for hope. And if someone says, I do not see a solution on the way out here, we know that person is seriously depressed. That's how important hope is. And biblical hope and spiritual hope is extremely important. It's an anchor for our soul. It's an anchor for our mind. 
And we need to know that God has an end game. He knows the end from the beginning and it's all going okay. And in the book of Exodus, what's the climax of the book of Exodus? And some people would say, what's well, the Red Sea? No, it's not. Some would say, what's well, the giving of the Ten Commandments? No, it's not. The climax of the book of Exodus is chapter 40, when God came down to dwell in a tabernacle in the midst of his people. And this is pointing to the greater tabernacle that Christ himself came and he tabernacled among us. He ascended to heaven and poured out his spirit to live in his people, that he would tabernacle in us, in the church. We would be the dwelling place, the tent, the tabernacle, the house of God. And even that, in the end, there's a new heaven and a new earth, and God will tabernacle with his peace forever. And that's the end game. That's the end of the book. We win. And no matter what happens in life, Nothing took God by surprise. He knew the end from the beginning. Before the foundation of the earth, Christ was crucified. Before, before the foundation of the earth, he had the church in mind. He had us in mind. And even though in my 70, 80, 90, or 103 years I'm going to live, whatever it is, it's such a small period of time. I'm part of something eternal. I've got a hope and so have you. It'd be wonderful that the Christians and churches were living like they really felt that was true. That there is a hope that will never disappoint us. It's a bit like, and forgive me for giving a football analogy. You may not ask me back after this, but I'm, I'm taping a match tonight. And it's Dundalk versus Arsenal. And I'm rooting for Dundalk, in case you're wondering. But I'm going to record that match. Now, if someone tells me the score of that match, I'll be very disappointed. But well, let's suppose Fergus does uh, check his phone and tells me the result of that match. And maybe, maybe it's 2 0 for Arsenal. Or 2 1, let's say. Uh, or, 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 or change around, say it's 2, two, two, two 1 for Dundalk. So I'm going for Dundalk. If I know the result of that match and Arsenal get a penalty, would I be worried? If Arsenal score first, would I be worried? No, because I know the end result. And brothers and sisters, there's a new heaven, a new earth. Our Christ rules, our Christ reigns. God's got everything in hand. If He can run the universe, He can run my life. If He can run the universe, He can. When we pray for our government, when we pray for our politicians, that God will help them and give them wisdom, we're crying out to somebody who knows the end. So let's be good news and sources, source of hope to other people. Finally, take you back just to the first verse that I, I read. Whatever was written in former days, including the story of Exodus, was written for our instruction. That means it's relevant to us, it's relevant now, that through endurance, and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I believe endurance is not surviving. Endurance is overcoming. And being a, a, a beacon of hope to, to other people. We have a great God. We have a great Christ. We have a great gospel. We have a spectacular God, actually. If I could use that word. So, amen. I'll just hand it back to you. Amen. Stephen, that was spectacular. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, uh, I just knew that Stephen coming here tonight, there would be a message of hope. Amen. Do you feel hope rising? Yeah. And again, with everybody watching it, thank you for everybody watching online. But we thank God that the online signal seems to have held. And again, we're just going to go into a time of prayer. And the word, and this, particularly this word that Stephen has brought tonight, it allows faith to be stirred up. Amen. 
Can you feel faith being stirred up? Can you feel hope being stirred up? So even here tonight, as that word of faith, that word of hope is stirred up, that means when we come to pray, we can come with expectancy. Because we have a spectacular God, and He's given us the end. And Christ is coming. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Amen. So in these days, we're seeing, as Stephen said, that the, the, the bride been made spectacular. That's you and me. The bride, we're being prepared for his return. And so let's press into that tonight. And there's a few people who've asked for prayer. Can I read some of those out? People watching online, feel free to leave your prayer requests as well in the comments there on our live stream. But I want to bring a, a number of people in, into prayer tonight. And as I do so, for people here in St. Patrick's, let's bring those we're carrying. I know some people have already arrived here. You're bringing someone to Jesus tonight. Amen. It's not amazing that we can bring someone to Jesus tonight. So let's do that. I want to bring, first of all, our good friend, James Tate. And Jim was a faithful member, is a faithful member of our team. And he's been in a residential home with Jim. Is suffering from COVID and we pray for him and for his wife Pauline. And we just want to bless Jim and he's been so many of you would know Jim from the past. He would have welcomed you at the doors at our different events. But we just want to bring Jim before the Lord now. We want to bring um, Alistair, who's over up in Donegal. Um, and Alistair's got pancreatic cancer. But Alistair's got Jesus. We want to bring Mary. We want to bring Maureen. We want to bring Wynne Sharp from our team. Before the Lord, we want to bring a, a, a young couple who are in Chile, the missionaries in Chile, and their, their four year old daughter died recently. So, we want to bring that Anglican pastor and his wife before the Lord. We want to bring Owen, who's a teenager who's having suicidal thoughts at the moment. And we bring all our young people before the Lord at this time that they would encounter a word of hope even tonight as we pray for them in faith and bring them to the Lord Jesus. Who do you want to bring to the Lord tonight? Because Jesus is here. Can I say that again? Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He's also present with those watching. The same Lord is here. He brings spectacular deliverance. He brings spectacular provision. He brings spectacular healing. He brings his presence. So into this Jesus, we want to bring those that we carry. Let's take a moment to do that right now. Just like just everybody watching online, just leaving comments of people. I want to bring uh, John, Reverend John Cunningham, the rector here, uh, St. Patrick's into this. We want to bring this parish of St. Patrick's. We want to bring this area, this part of Belfast, New Arts Road, from this end behind us, right on up, that we would see a move of God in this place and in this area. bring Brother David who uh, brought a powerful message to us last Thursday. So we want to bring Brother David in equipping for life. And Lord, we bring to you every family represented here right now. Every family represented watching online. And we declare and decree that salvation has come to this household to your house. And finally, let's allow the Lord to touch 
What part of our lives will we need His touch here tonight? The Lord would say to you and to me here tonight, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? So take a moment and present yourself to the Lord who is here present. Allow the Lord to touch your life right now and mine. Let's be quiet and allow the Lord to do what he wants to do. Let's begin to give thanks to the Lord. Our prayer time on Monday night focused on giving thanks. Psalm 100, it's, we enter its gates with thanksgiving, its courts with praise. Let's begin to take a moment just to give thanks. What do you want to give thanks for tonight to the Lord? Let's take a moment to do that. Lord, I thank you for this night. Thank you for this word of the way you're present with us, for your provision, for your promises. Thank you, Lord, for your hope in Jesus. Lord, thank you for that we can see what you're doing even in these times. What do you want to thank the Lord for? I'm going to take a moment to do that. Say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we want to bless each other in the name of Jesus. So, in the name of Jesus, I bless you. I bless you with the peace of the Lord. I bless you with the joy of the Lord. I bless you with the hope of the Lord. In Jesus' name, I bless you with that word that you entered its gates with thanksgiving and its courts with praise. I bless you in Jesus' name tonight with that word of hope, that that word of hope would bubble up within you. I bless you with hope for your family. In Jesus' name, I bless you to know that the Lord is hearing your prayer in the courts of heaven. And I bless you in Jesus' name to be able to surrender every part of your life to the Lord.
Thank you. I believe the Lord wants to heal tonight, so if there's an area of your body where you want this healing touch, if you can't put your hand on it, or simply to open up your hands like this. So again, if you're watching online or here in St. Patrick's, the Lord wants to heal tonight. So let's take a moment, allow him to do that. The same Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever. It's just to place your hand and say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I trust in you. I trust in you. I receive your healing in Jesus' name. I receive your healing in Jesus' name. I receive your healing in Jesus' name. The Lord has left in depression tonight. The Lord is stirring up faith tonight. The Lord is bringing reconciliation in families tonight. Yes, the Lord is bringing reconciliation in families tonight. The Lord is touching those children that you've prayed for for many years, even tonight. Thank you, Lord. Let's take a moment, just a final moment, allow the Lord to do what He needs to do. Let's be quiet for one final moment. So the Lord bless you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance towards you. Give you his peace both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. We're going to ask uh, first uh, if Maureen and Ivan could sing one more song for us and then before we finish we'll ask John to lead us in a final prayer blessing after the final song John if that's okay um, maybe Pat I know you had a word could you bring that word if you feel you're able to do that morning after I sent for this text. I felt Lord saying, tell them to come expectantly to receive the desires of their heart. Dare to believe, dare to hope, dare to stand on my word, for I am willing to give them what they need. I am all powerful, all knowing, and I only ask that you open your heart to receive what I have for you. Truly believe that I am the Lord and watch and be amazed at the work of my hand.